you go. All right, this is dopamine graph, scene one, take one. We good? Yeah. All right, so the reason I came up with this topic, the reason I want to talk about it is I got a message in my inbox and somebody told me, I beat your so-called alcoholism and I've got a couple days sober. And I responded back and said, you know, nobody beats alcoholism. It's kind of like, you didn't get me today, I didn't get you, I'll see you tomorrow. And you maintain sobriety, right? So I wanted to do this graph, I wanted to show this right here, uh, so I can show you what I mean by you don't beat alcoholism, right? We maintain sobriety. So we are low on dopamine in our brains. That's the natural state of an alcoholic, causing us to be restless, irritable, and discontent. But what does that mean? Dopamine is a positive neurotransmitter fluid. And the best way to explain it is when normal people see their kids go to an event, do something, normal things make them happy. You know the people that whistle all the way to the coffee pot in the morning, they wake up in a great mood? That's not me because I'm low on dopamine. This is a normal person's dopamine level right here. Right? This is my dopamine level. Naturally low. Causing me to be restless, irritable, discontented. When a normal person goes out, takes a drink, smokes weed, bumps a line, whatever it is, they get a dopamine spike. Shoots up here like this. They get a buzz. Right? Then it drops back down here and they go on to work. They pay their bills. They handle their responsibilities. A normal person that has regular dopamine. For me, when I use, this is my dopamine level down here. I take a hit of something and my dopamine shoots way up here. I get a buzz. Right? But then here's the thing. It drops back down to the normally low level, then it drops way down here. See? And then it takes seven to ten days for it to come back up to normally low, restless, irritable, discontent. This area right here is called the phenomenon of craving. This is where people's shit comes up missing. This is where people's credit cards get stolen. Things get pawned, right? So I take a hit, it shoots up, it drops down here really low. And this is seven to 10 days to correct and come back up here. And that's why we usually want you to stay in detox seven to 10 days to allow this to go away. When you are low on dopamine, I wake up every morning restless, irritable, and discontent, right? I argue with people in my head that are not even there. When I, the moment I wake up, before I have coffee, before my brain is awake, I've already had in my head an argument with my parents, an argument with Elena. I'm already cussing out my boss in my head but nobody's there. So understanding that it's the manifestation of a physical allergy. Anytime I put alcohol or some type of narcotics in my body, this process will take place. I will get a buzz, I will drop back down to my normal low state, but I come much lower down here, setting off the phenomenon of craving, which causes me to want more, more of everything. You know, normal people, they go out and drink, buy a six pack. They drink two of them and then say, no, I better not drink anymore because I have to drive home, right? I smash the whole six pack, go buy another one and start looking for cocaine because of this right here. See, the normal person drinks, get a buzz, then they can carry on with their responsibilities. This is why I can't smoke one joint or one blunt or one bong yet. I can't have just one beer because when my dopamine levels drop down here to abnormally low, this is low for even me, and this process takes place right here, the phenomenon of craving, I will do absolutely anything to make that feeling go away. Some of y'all have watched other people go through this or you've been through it yourself. The cold sweats, the diarrhea, vomiting, jitters, it's awful. It's like the worst flu you've ever had in your life times 10. And I have to have something else to correct it. I'm constantly trying to get my level to go back up so I can feel normal. And you know, I equate this to uh, Chinese water torture, right? There's a reason why they call that stuff torture. It's like the tapping on your forehead. It just keeps tapping, 
You can't focus, you can't think, you can't sleep, you can't do your job. It's just always there. That's why they call that stuff torture. You're restless, irritable, and discontent because you're low on dopamine, and this just will not go away. Then you drink alcohol or use some type of narcotic, and temporarily it stops. What happens every time we use? What happens anytime someone takes a drink off of a beer? What's the first thing they do? <sighs> right? That is stopped then the dopamine starts to drop back down and you go abnormally low and there it is. Again, I can't focus, I can't think, I'm restless, irritable, I'm discontented, I'm mean to everybody around me, I'm easily angered or annoyed and I cannot make that stop again until I use again. And you wonder why. Why can't I stop? Why can't I stop using? I don't know why I swore the other day when I got locked up or I swore when I woke up with that hangover on Monday that I was never going to drink again. I'm not doing this to myself anymore. Then the first time we get a chance, first time you get a paycheck or anything of that nature, you're right back on it. It's because you're trying to make this, that torture of restless, irritable, and discontent go away. I learned that there's no chemical that can correct this for you. There's substances out there and I don't care whether it's Ibogaine, Suboxone, Methadone, whatever it is, there's no chemical that can help you correct this. We have to maintenance it. We have to maintain our sobriety. One of the biggest things I learned is that there's three God-given instincts that every human being has that will stop us from getting help. What do I mean by that? There's the social security and the sexual instinct. Social, everybody wants to be cool. Everybody wants to be the popular guy at the party or the popular girl, right? We like nice cars, nice clothes, nice house. That's a social instinct. Look at me, I'm making it, I'm surviving, I'm doing good in this life, right? Same with the security instinct. Everybody wants to have money. Everybody wants to send your kids to college and pay for their cars and be able to buy your clothes and pay bills and say, you know, I'm a man, I'm secure and what I do. And then the sexual instinct, everybody's always trying to attract a partner of some sort, right? So these three instincts can actually backfire on you where your survival instincts will stop you from surviving. These three survival instincts can stop you from getting help because of the delusion, right? My social instinct, I can't go get help because I don't want everyone at work or my friends or my neighbors to know I was gone for 30 or 40 days. They're all going to find out. They're going to think I'm weak. See, that's a social instinct right there. People tell me that all the time. I can't go get help because I can't tell anybody. I need to keep this a secret. Let me tell you this. You're not going to beat heroin, Xanax, or full-blown alcoholism in secret, away from your wife, away from your parents. The security instinct your house, your car, your job, all of this stuff that makes up your life, right? People will tell me, I can't go get help because of my house, because of my car, because of my job, right? Do you hear that? The delusion in that I can't stop shooting heroin, I can't stop shooting fentanyl or taking benzodiazepines or drinking myself to death because of this great life that I've built for myself. See, that's a survival instinct. You're trying to protect your home, your money, and how you maintain. You wanna protect that. That's a survival instinct. And your survival instinct tells you you can't walk away from this stuff to go get off of heroin or go get off of whatever it is you're using because you're going to lose everything that you have. It's completely delusional to think that it's okay to sit at kids' birthday parties or family reunions or go to your own wedding when you're shooting up in the bathroom before because you have to protect all this stuff. Then the sexual instinct, uh, that's a big one. There's a lot of people that won't go get help because they're afraid to be away from their significant other for a period of 30 days or 40 days. They say, oh, I, I can't go because I'm not going to be away from my wife that long or away from my husband for that long. They say, I can't go 
And let, what about this? A couple that's using together, they say, we will not go get help. We will not go to any type of treatment, detox at all, unless we can be together. We're each other's support system, right? No. You've been supporting each other, killing yourselves. You've been supporting each other, shooting up, taking dangerous narcotics, mixing them with alcohol and destroying your body. That's what you've been supporting each other through. The idea that having to share a room and be in the same building while you deal with drug and alcohol addiction is absolutely delusional. And we don't do it. Let me tell you this. For the couples where one person is using, sometimes the addict wants to go get that help. They want to go. And then their spouse, be it male or female, says, no, you're not going. You're not going to be gone for 30 or 45 days away from me. And they will allow that person to continue to shoot heroin in their house because they're scared of being apart. They're willing to let you kill yourself in front of them rather than go get some help. If you or someone you love are stuck in this type of situation, the thing to do is you have to make a plan. You don't have to make a decision tonight or in the morning. You need to plan it out first. Who are you going to trust to talk to? Where are you going to go to get this help? And then how do we lay it out to where you don't lose your house, you don't lose your car, your job, your kids? We're here to protect you from losing all that. We want to catch you before the bottom shows up. So if you're stuck in this situation and you don't know what to do, reach out. Get some help from someone that knows what they're doing. You can message me at the top of my page. You can follow me along my journey, and we will put you in contact with people that can help you. Until next time, my name is James Sweezy. I've been there before, and I know the way out. If you want to make a Personal plan, all message. you have to do is message me at the top of my page. There you go. What would you tell me to do? I don't know if you want to give your cell phone number. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Try that. Try that. <laughs> <laughs>